So basically, I was convinced that traditional models of how work motivation were perceived by organizations around using carrots and sticks, economic kind of things, or heavily um, uh, you know, lovey-dovey human, humanistic psychology approaches, were missing something. And so my journey in my PhD began looking for alternative ways of conceptualizing work motivation. And I came across self-efficacy, which is part of social cognitive theory. And it really struck a chord with me, based on my managerial and consulting experience and educational experience, that this was a tool that could be used more to help organizations lift their performance. And the thing, one of the things that really got my, um, captured my attention when you do, uh, all the research showed that self-efficacy based interventions lift performance on average by about 28% compared to, um, you know, if someone has a group of people go through, increase their self-efficacy, you get increased performance. Other interventions like goal setting or feedback and coaching were much lower. I thought, well, why aren't organizations using this more? So when I, be, when I saw that, I went, well, we should actually test this out because another piece of research I came across showed that there had been very few times where they'd actually set up interventions that were in the workplace with real people doing real jobs where their performance was measured in terms of real tasks, not some simulation, not a, a undergraduate psychology class or a first year MBA class, for example. So I thought it would be really cool to test whether or not that theory applied in practice. Um, and so, because it showed there was such a strong connection between self-efficacy and performance, I thought we should organizations should be doing more of this. And so that's what I, I really set out to do. And, and the results demonstrated that, that totally affirmed what the theory predicted. If you increase someone's self-efficacy, it does lead to an increase in performance. Yeah. Well, B-learning works at several different levels. So just in terms of self-efficacy, there's three sort of core tenets to how self-efficacy works. First of all, it's about somebody's personal agency and control, their belief in that. Secondly, it's about their confidence and their competence to undertake challenging tasks. And thirdly, it's their belief in their ability to achieve successful outcomes, that, that the bar is being set at an appropriate level. So if you look at each of those three different factors, what, what B does through some of the theater interventions, like foreign theater, for example, it actually helps people gain a greater sense of their personal agency. So that they actually see that they can actually do something about what's going on. It, in, it, and that was Boel's original objective, was to create a sense of self for people to rise up and become more empowered in effect. So that's one key thing that I think really distinguishes organizational theater interventions is that sense of creating agency for people. Secondly, um, the whole, for example, with rehearsed reality, the way in which um, uh, people get, are able to practice and get a chance to gain more confidence in their competence to undertake challenging tasks. You keep working through it, working through it, provide role models. So people become more confident. So when they go back into the workplace, they've had a chance to practice it. Not only have they kind of gone through the cognitive process, but they've had the emotional experience of thinking, oh, this is really hard. And that allows them to try it when they go back to work. And in the third area, and this is what we do with, with, with the intervention that I used, the stuff, the film um, interventions that, that or the film treatments that B creates, they act as a well, they can act as, a, as an agency creation, confidence boosting um, tool in their own right, but it also becomes a tremendous behavioral reinforcement tool. So if you kind of get people feeling more agentic, increase their confidence, then they go back to work and they scrape their knees and it's all too hard, you bring the film in and they go, oh yeah, that's right, that's what we did before, oh maybe I can remember how to do that. And so it supports them in a way that allows them to get on with what it is they want to do. The, uh, the work that I did um, for one of the two uh, uh, organizations we partnered with for my PhD, um, it was around helping employees to become um, better at initiating conversations with customers that led to appointments to review their um, financial health, so to speak. And it was not an explicit part of the uh, exercise to increase sales. All they were really after was, could we increase the number of appointments because employees were finding it challenging to be proactive and ask customers to come in for an appointment. And what we found was that we were able to increase the number of appointments, not, not by a huge amount, but it was statistically significant. But the, the bonus was that every second appointment, additional appointment, led to a product sale. And so um, 
uh, we were able to then calculate what the financial benefit of that was. And it was around 300% return on investment in the first year. So it, it, the holy grail in learning and development is how do I evaluate my programs? How do I determine whether I'm having a financial impact on the business? And that was one of the motivations for um, St. George, who were the sponsors for this research, to get involved. And we were able to show them, yeah, spend this, use this process. That's the value that's, that's delivered. I'm interested, I want to do more replication types of studies to see if that plays out in other environments. But um, I think most CEOs of most companies would be very happy to get a 300% return on, on an investment in anything, let alone learning and development.